All right, well, let's get started. My name is Kirsten Parsons. I welcome you today. I'm so grateful that you're joining us. It's wonderful to be able to virtually be together from multiple locations. I know we've got representation on the call from Rockville, Maryland and Northwest DC. So I welcome you today. I wanna to share with you a little bit about the Ingleside communities. And then we are here in the right place for Mariana Blackburn's lecture on storytelling as a therapeutic tool in memory programming. So I do wanna introduce you to the Ingleside communities. Many of you may already know one of our communities or more than one, but we do have three locations. Ingleside at Rock Creek in Northwest DC is our flagship community. This community's history dates back to the early 1900s and on this particular property in Northwest DC since the 60s, we are thrilled to offer every level of care at all three of our communities. So we are life plan, or maybe you've heard the term continuing care retirement communities. Ingleside at Rock Creek does boast independent living, assisted living and skilled nursing, as well as memory support services at the assisted living level of care. Westminster at Lake Ridge in Prince William County, Virginia, also has independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. And they have memory care services at the skilled level. Ingleside at King Farm, our community in Rockville, Maryland, also has independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. We have programs for memory support at the assisted living level and memory care at the skilled level, as well as a social day program. What I briefly wanna do is introduce to you what's currently available. Now I know this can change quickly, but I do wanna share as of today what we've got available in the community and invite you um, to give me a call if this is something you, that you are actively interested in. At Ingleside at King Farm in our assisted living neighborhoods, we do have availability in our traditional assisted living of one bedroom apartments and in our memory support assisted living of our standard studio. You can see pictures on the left of our traditional assisted living one bedroom apartment and on the right of our standard studio and memory support assisted living. At Ingleside at Rock Creek, we are presently waitlist for traditional assisted living and our memory support assisted living. What I've shown here are pictures of our standard studio. This is the apartment that is most frequent in our floor plan. And so something that would come available uh, would likely be this floor plan. And so certainly again, do reach out if pursuing the waitlist is something you're interested in at Ingleside at Rock Creek. And lastly, our sister community in Virginia, Westminster at Lake Ridge, we do presently have availability in traditional assisted living of our standard studio. So I do wanna make mention of our respite program. This is something that we're able to offer at both communities, Ingleside at King Farm and Ingleside at Rock Creek in our traditional assisted living and memory support assisted living as we have availability. So this is a great opportunity um, in two scenarios specifically, one is if your loved one is in short-term rehab with an end goal to get back home to their independent setting, but maybe needs an additional time period uh, to be in a care environment where they have some support and can continue that therapy at the assisted living level of care. And so this is a 30-day trial stay or respite or continued care following maybe a short-term rehab stay. We also offer this as a respite program, particularly looking at our memory support communities when a loved one um, has travel coming up and um, or maybe a, potentially a surgery or something that is planned in their own care and needs to actually step back from being primary caregiver for their loved one with dementia. So if this is something that would be uh, helpful to you or of interest, please do reach out and I can share with you where we have availabilities and where we can support you in this way. So lastly, I just want to share my contact information with you. That is a cell phone. So you are welcome to text or call whatever is most convenient for you. I want to make sure that I'm able to answer your questions as you have inquiries related to either memory support or our traditional assisted living. So without any further delay, I would just want to introduce to you who we have on our call today. 
Maureen Charlton is our Memory Programming and Services Director at our Ingleside at King Farm, Rockville, Maryland location. She's on the call today to answer questions. We will save those questions towards the end. And then our speaker for today, Mariana Blackburn. She joins us from Ingleside at Rock Creek in Northwest DC. Mariana, I will let you introduce yourself. Okay. 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 Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for being here this afternoon to hear the, uh, about the art of storytelling as a therapeutic tool in memory support programming. I am a cult cultural anthropologist in memory support. I have been working with uh, seniors primarily uh, with memory loss for approximately 11 years. And um, in my own uh, anthropo anthropological studies, I did focus on life stories and storytelling amongst the elderly. So I bring uh, to this um, program uh, a focus on eliciting individualized expressions and helping people to recover their stories and to tell them as they remain uh, as they remain available to our our residents. And for those of you at home, uh, this the art of storytelling will hopefully uh, help help you in in uh, validating what your loved ones are saying and help you to um, support them on this journey. Here uh, at Ingleside, we look past the disease uh, to the person. And we hope uh, some of the skills you will learn today will help you uh, as you support your loved one. Our goal is to provide insight um, on storytelling, including the frame of storytelling as a therapeutic tool. Uh, we also will show, we'll also touch upon Ingleside's well being philosophy and how storytelling helps us. In, uh, in, in that area, as well as in our person-centered care, our delivery of person-centered care. Uh, we do believe storytelling is an important therapeutic tool uh, in, in advancing the care relationship. Storytelling, a, public, a form of public talk about oneself. Typically, when we think of storytelling, we may think of the vivid description of ideas and beliefs and personal experiences, even life lessons, uh, which come together in a, in a narrative, um, which are very powerful. Uh, it's a very, very powerful to, to tool to convey information. And uh, that's where we're going to focus today, the powerful tool uh, of personal stories. We know them uh, for being very impactful on identity. They tell us who we are, they promote resilience, and they support the person in transition. For those of us who live with loved ones with memory loss, and for those of us who care for those with memory loss in assisted living or in long-term care, we know that person has been, uh, is transitioning. They've made an adjustment from when they were uh, more well. And um, however, we do believe in supporting them through this journey and helping them to become resilient and to enjoy what they have remaining. It, storytelling, we believe, helps in speaking about what is remaining for the person, what is important. And we're gonna talk about some specific programs that we have developed here at Ingleside that help our residents speak about what is really important. We believe it offers a structure for individualized expression, uh, which is really important because we will see that the disease can sometimes rob uh, the sufferer from being able to initiate conversation, but storytelling can be a powerful tool for helping in the individualized expression. We know it to be a therapeutic in intervention for building rapport and deepening the quality of relationships with others. 
We have an intentional community in memory support assisted living, and we believe connections with others is key to well being, including wellness as one of the tenets of well being. Here we see a wonderful uh, uh, diagram of Ingleside's well being philosophy, the seven, uh, the six tenets, I'm sorry, on this uh, uh, around the, uh, the middle uh, octagon. We're going to focus today on wellness and connection. We are, we'll see through the many examples I have for you today how storytelling helps our residents with purposeful living, being authentic, having autonomy in their choice making, and being seen and being heard. Wellness for people with neurocognitive decline. We believe that it enhances the quality of life for those living with memory loss. It is a process. We believe wellness is a process that is inclusive of disease and non-disease states. And we recognize wellness by patterns of person-to-person -person interactions in an environment, whether the person is at home interacting with us uh, or other family members and friends who visit. We see the same here. We recognize uh, who is doing well, who may be a little more uh, agitated at that particular time, but we recognize wellness by these patterns of person-to-person -person interactions in our environment. We believe as a practice in our work uh, that storytelling encourage us to, encourages us to learn personal histories of residents, uh, individual goals for them, and knowledge of barriers. For example, when we have someone living with us and aphasia is an issue for them. We recognize that that's a barrier, but we use storytelling even with those uh, suffering from word loss. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We develop strategies to facilitate their, their connection, uh, such as use of stories, poetry, photographs, artifacts, and many other ways where we support a friendly, culturally enriching environment with opportunities for connection with people. That's our focus. More than a concept in our well-being philosophy at Ingleside, we believe that connection is the foundation of all relationships. In memory support, connection is particularly important. And we begin the day by using a technique called framing. We frame the day with each person feeling seen, heard, and valued simply for the sake of who they are. And connection, we know, keeps us all from, fe from feeling lost, but particularly in memory support. Imagine yourself. This is a scenario I ask you to think about uh, before we move forward. Imagine yourself standing in the middle of a busy, far off place within a country where you do not live, surrounded by people where you do not speak their language. The busyness is overwhelming. You watch people walk quickly by you, speaking quickly in words you do not understand, smiling and laughing, busying themselves with all the sights and sounds. Everything is unfamiliar and whirling at a speed that is difficult to comprehend. Where is everyone going? Why is everyone rushing? What are they doing? You do not know how you got to this place. You feel lost and looking for directions home. You try to catch people's attention and let them know you want to go home, but people continue to pass by. You say again and again, I want to go home. Then a person stops walking and makes eye contact with you. They smile, they nod their head or say a word or two, which is unrecognizable. They point and hand you a pineapple. Then they shake their head again and walk off. No, I want to go home. Is there anyone available to help me find my way home? Is there anyone here that understands? This is how we might imagine a person with memory loss, especially those in the late, uh, in the middle to a late moderate stage in the beginning of advanced. 
In our environment at Ingleside, we frame and narrate the day that makes the connection and builds the story. It's more than a concept. It is at the core of our, all relationships. Framing and narrating the day grounds the person in a time and place with conscious and intentional communication and commitment. Each person in our community is seen and heard and welcomed to the conversation of the day. On the worker side, it also honors the personal professional bond to guide our residents through their day. We guide them through their day and our own day. Collaboration on the day happens with in wellness. We look at spiritual life and our team there, our life enrichment team, healthcare and dining services teams. We build the day with all of those folks with us and we support and encourage a natural bonding um, between the folks in our residents and we help them intentionally interact with their neighbors, their friends, their caregivers, our professional workers, of course, our surroundings, and we connect them to the world at large in our programs. We believe that the quality of the connection supports validation for each person being seen and heard and it allows a shared story to emerge. What are some of the practical applications in dementia specific settings that help to facilitate the delivery of person-centered care? We know that person-centered care can be open to interpretation. Um, there are three themes, however, that emerge. Understanding the person engagement in decision-making, promoting the care relationships. We're gonna talk about how storytelling helps in each one of those areas for the support of the delivery of person-centered care. There are goals for the residents. Each day here at Ingleside, our goals are to elicit individualized expression, verbal and nonverbal, noting that there are varying levels of abilities. Uh, in, amongst our resident population. We know storytelling mitigates isolation caused by social withdrawal brought on by the disease. We also know that it supports authenticity, growth, and being on the journey of continuing learning. It builds community and supports connection to others. It supports belonging helps our residents in the development of new relationships of support. And in most importantly, it uses the power of the resident's voice to validate being seen and heard. Here at Ingleside at Rock Creek, once again, we our well-being model looks past the disease to the person. The model focuses on feeling connected, authentic, honors the difficult and supports companioning one another in an intentional community. Everyone belongs. We meet our residents on the journey. We believe they teach us. There are two myths that we often encounter when families first approach us for memory support. One is that people who have cognitive change cannot learn new things because they cannot remember. Or another myth is people with cognitive change will have a similar journey. We believe here at Ingleside in all of our, in all of our programs that it, it's not true that people with memory loss can learn new things. They may learn new things in the moment and they'll recognize those things that they are learning uh, through our programming, which we feel supports and reflects the lives they led before the disease. We also know that no two people are alike in memory support. What makes a memory support program different than other programs? Here at Ingleside, we believe imagination is our greatest resource. So our programs are designed to represent attributes of our of our lives, of our residents' travels, of their interests, their learning journeys, past, present, and future. Families and visitors should be able to join them at the programs. They too should be able to learn something new. 
We believe that people living with dementia experience a constellation of diminishments. They don't see as well. They don't hear as well. Their tastes may have changed. Their perceptions of what's going on have, has changed. And we honor those changes. We help them in the transition. We believe any topic can be de developed and delivered for memory support, but they must have visual anchors, bright colors. The person delivering the program must use an upbeat and friendly tone, a moderate pace, and always include a story frame with open-ended questions to elicit thoughts and ideas from the residents. I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. In Barely Support Assisted Living, we look at the design of the day. We look at structure, which I'm gonna talk about now, and we look at contact, content, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Structure. Many times in memory support, we use a calendar. Even at home, it helps to have a calendar often, in the, especially in the beginning stages of the moderate stage of memory loss, where we can point to a calendar and show what we're going to do today. We believe that narrating the day to convey information on what is about to happen is a structure that our residents recognize. They are professionals, they have been to school, they recognize the structure of being introduced to what we're going to do. We use accessible words for general understanding. We keep a moderate pace and we do use somewhat of a performance style where possible to capture, to capture their attention, to help them maintain their attention throughout the program. I, I have to uh, say that when we interview people in life enrichment um, or others who may be delivering a program, we talk about the importance of uh, elocution, of using your voice, of maybe changing your position, standing up, sitting down, of uh, engaging the residents um, through your tone and uh, really performing what it is that you're doing for them. So they have an opportunity to pay attention, but also to begin to think, their minds begin to think about what you're saying. Our programs last 40 to 45 minutes to mitigate restlessness and orientation. Um, for example, uh, we may have on the calendar between 10 and 12, three programs before lunch. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of these programs. We have the Walker's Club or Morning Greetings, which are really, uh, it's really a program on news you can use. So we offer an option there in the morning to start your day. Some people like to start the day with the news, others like to start with exercise. So here we're proud to be able to offer that, those options. Almost always after the Walker's Club or midway through the morning greetings, we have a hydration break followed by a program in health trivia, science trivia, or geography, something that takes advantage of the fact that we've just finished a program on the news or the Walker's Club, but using the uh, hydration as a way to talk about oxygenated blood cells and its impact on the body. We make it fun. Uh, and then we move right into an upper body seated workout for older bodies. Everyone participates in that and that gets us to lunch, but we've been able to narrate the day, convey information, engage with questions and begin to build the story of the day. It's in that engagement with them that they begin to tell us the story of what they're thinking. Looking more at content. The design of the day is also important because we're going to now uh, focus on how we're going, what it is that we're going to convey to them in terms of information. We almost always have a visual anchor, even in the Walker's Club. I'll talk a little bit about the Walker's Club because I think it's an important uh, program that uh, allows for us to be outdoors and, and indoors and walking and talking. So much of what we might do uh, every day in our lives today. 
in planning the walks, um, it's really important to research, uh, to do some research. Uh, in our case, we talk about horticultural designs of English and Southern gardens because we see mi a mixture of that in our own garden here at Ingleside. We identify the trees, the flowers, the grasses. We offer visual cues. We talk about color and texture. So we're walking, but we're curating the walk with, a, with the fact that we've planned and we've done some research to, to meet the intellectual curiosity of our residents. We, we do have seated breaks. In fact, we take a 50 minute walk with two seated breaks and we pose questions uh, along the way and, and actually uh, during the uh, seated breaks. We might say, what is the focal point of the garden uh, as we're seated nearby the sundial? We ask them to think about gardens they have tended to or visited in, in their lifetime. Many of our residents are come from families uh, who have had gardens. They may have had victory gardens after the war that comes up as part of their story. They may remember that they had their own cucumber patch that may come up, but they're beginning to share the stories because the topic is intellectually uh, at the level where they recognize that they can participate and they recognize the, uh, uh, the, the, the richness of the discussion. And they also remember their own experiences walking in gardens with families or playing with children. Um, we also talk about what are the differences. I I'm almost always have a contrasting set of questions that talk about what is the difference uh, between a guard walking in the garden and walking in the forest. And in that moment, we note who talks, who nods, uh, who's paying attention, who's looking around, how others react, what statements they are offering as an opportunity for, dis for discussion to go down another road uh, to another uh, point of discussion. These are their stories that they share, but we elicit them through the structure of our program and using the storytelling framing and um, attributes to encourage their participation. One of our favorite programs is our storytelling conversation on the arts. Um, this is a series uh, that unfolds every day here at Ingleside. It can be on the visual arts. It, it may focus on architecture, uh, sculptures, literature, music, performing arts, and the cinema. These are all topics of interest uh, in our community. And one of our favorites is uh, a, a focus on Norman Rockwell. As you may remember, he's a native of New England and uh, he was famous for his Saturday Evening Post covers during the 1950s and 60s. What I like about his art and what's intriguing for our residents is that they, in one image, Norman Rockwell shows us everything we need to know. So their facial expressions, there's family life, uh, their generations uh, present in his paintings, um, their adult activities, their children's activities. And there is a major moment that's happening in this particular favorite um, painting of Norman Rockwell's. But we, we talk about it when I open up the program, I may tell them uh, a little bit about Norman Rockwell and how he focused in part on the intellectual prowess of women. He focused on the military patriotism. So I give them a frame and then we begin looking at the frame to see what we might like about it. And then finally, this evokes a very textured and rich discussion on what it makes them think of. I remember the first time uh, telling, uh, showing this painting to a couple of new gentlemen arrived in our, in our memory support program. And one remembered that on V-Day, September 2nd, he was the, he was, his father chose him to take a bell and run up and down the street to talk about how the war had ended in a tiny town in upstate New York. And it was the painting, we started with this painting and we weren't talking about V-Day, but it made VJ Day, but it made him remember that. And when he told that story, then another one talked about the Victory Garden that his family had 
and how they had a big feast and invited everybody uh, to a picnic to, uh, to commemorate the end of the war. So I just, uh, the visual anchor uh, is the point here in our discussions and the storytelling conversations that we have here in our programming and how, how important it is to have the visual anchor. Because even when people seem lost or disoriented uh, for that moment, or maybe there's been a sound coming in from the dining room or another area where they're distracted, but when they come back into the focus, they remember where they are. Very powerful tool in terms of storytelling conversation. For many of us, we have programs that are already existing uh, in wherever our loved one may be, or um, in my case here at Memory Support Assisted Living at Ingleside, when I arrived, we had an amazing program uh, that was being delivered by the Levine School of Music. It's our music therapy program. We have it twice weekly, twice weekly, it lasts an hour. It focuses, it's a group activity, but it also has an opportunity for the music therapist to interact one-to-one -one with someone who may be a little more advanced uh, at that period in, in time. And the, at the heart of the program, the therapist would play songs for singing. Um, there would be instrumentation, which is terrific because it allows for sequencing, which is one of the things that uh, the disease robs those uh, suffering from it. The ability to know what comes next and then next and then next. You'll notice that some residents with memory loss in the moderate to advanced stages would not be able to use a cell phone with ease or um, uh, a remote control because those things we take for granted, but they require sequencing. But the instrumentation was, uh, was being used in this program. It does allow for sequencing, um, but the way that the music therapist uh, facilitates this piece of the program really helps uh, our residents in being able to make music and it helps them with physical movement. So often there'll be an opportunity to even dance or uh, use your upper body and swaying or clapping, even though you're carrying out uh, the instrumentation. Now, when I came in and I made my observation of the program, I only wanted to make a few tweaks. And the tweaks had to do with, again, uh, the storytelling frame. The therapist, I asked the therapist to please introduce the genre of music and uh, to talk about the composer, the time period, how it connected the audience at a particular time in their lives to that music, and then have an opportunity for uh, questions, for discussion, for story building, and for building community. Often, as with all of us, when one person says something, another person, it germinates an idea in another person, allowing for the, the, the community to be uh, to become more engaged with one another. Um, and so we, we made a few tweaks and it's easy to make a few tweaks to existing programs with the storytelling frame. In memory support, we do believe that um, we have the opportunity for cognitive programming, for social engagement, for individualized expression. We know that the storytelling builds community and increases bonding and sharing. Uh, we do know as workers, our participants' biographies, including any current interests. Um, and it's really at the core of this popular program. Um, it's called What's on Your Mind? And uh, we emphasize experiences and available memories. Uh, we always have 10 to 12, which is a good group size of varying levels of abilities and even aphasia progression. However, the topics are designed for reminiscence around connection and discovering the person beyond the disease. Some of the topics with great success we've used are unlikely friendships. We had uh, several people talk about friends they had when they were very young um, whom they lost contact with later in life and then resumed contact with. Um, we, a sort of a reunion 
Um, but the friendship was unlikely because in growing up, they came from different families. Um, we had a, a wonderful story by a gentleman who talked about a friend who was an unlikely friend in the military and how the friend came from an a urban environment, he came from a country environment and they shared so many stories, they became lifelong friends. Another great program we've done uh, on the uh, discussion program, What's On Your Mind, is for asking our residents to tell us what was the, who was the greatest or what was the greatest influence in their lives as young people and why. Very rich discussion. They can almost always, to the person, remember someone who impacted on, on their lives and why. We had a wonderful program on advice uh, they would give to their younger selves. Uh, these are all questions that have helped them to tell their story. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, a program we did recently. Uh, we pretended it was graduation and they were the speaker. And they gave us each words of wisdom to the graduating class. Some of the more compelling answers focused on um, what they would say uh, even to their younger selves. Uh, one gentleman talked about um, what he would say to anyone graduating today is that not to worry about your work and to start at the very beginning, just jump in and it doesn't really matter where you're starting because you're gonna end up in a, a totally different place and you have no idea where your life's gonna take you. I thought that was profound wisdom. Again, it, and it evoked conversations from others. Uh, another person, because of that conversation said, yes, but before you graduate, before you leave, she said, you must go to each teacher and ask that teacher if you're headed in the right direction. And I thought that was a wonderful um, bit of wisdom coming from someone with memory loss, but gathering enough of themselves in the storytelling environment to put together great tips for others. We are gonna have residents who are not having a great day. Uh, most days we're going to encounter residents who have what I call emotional thinness at a certain part of the day. We call it, uh, we, you know, we do have um, ways in which we frame how they're feeling. Uh, they are sundowning, but sometimes people are, are just feeling sad and it has nothing to do with sundowning and they may be able to express it, but they don't have the words. So we may see some of these expressions and um, some of the ways in which we hold our hands or uh, we move our bodies, but they're asking to be understood, to love me. I miss my children. I'm sad. I need something. Uh, I'm in a panic. I'm unsure. They teach us how it is to live with the suffering of this disease. And so we do know that storytelling conversations, what you know about that particular person can have an impact on behaviors and memory support. When words are lost, behavior is communication. And some people have personality traits that make them difficult to like. Um, we often know that there are persons can, a person can have extreme neediness, they can have challenges. Um, and we have to do our work as well. So how do we stop and tend to that person as a worker? Many times in, in, in when I'm training the staff, I talk about the importance of knowing the story of that person to help redirect them and talk about, oh, I know your son is coming later today. I have to remember to make sure we cut, we comb your hair just before he comes. And uh, there are so many techniques that we can talk about at the question and answer period. But knowing the person's story is really important because you're going to convey snippets of that story to the person to redirect and cue them to another uh, part of their, their thinking. We emphasize patience, of course, empathy and tolerance uh, and forgiveness. We don't take the challenging interactions personally, or hopefully we don't. But having the story can be a powerful tool for insight and intervention. 
Burning Bridges, I call this. Storytelling conversations offer emotional safety and connection. People with cognitive decline may experience personality changes in ways that make them more or less reactive or impulsive. We see this even, even in family relationships and longtime friends where the person may feel disconnected and not as close uh, to the person visiting or the family member, member, even children and spouses. For the person with cognitive decline, it's important to remember that it's easier to feel disconnected because many of the abilities we use to connect uh, are our words and thoughts and social skills. They become limited through the disease pro process. Our best practices are that we help each person continue positive relationships in ways that they can best tolerate and participate in. So helping them to know um, why the person is visiting and how happy they are to see the other person and helping them to facilitate much like a host uh, that at a dinner table, at a dinner party, you would begin to find the connections. But if you don't know the stories and you don't um, know them and how they might react, you may have difficulty uh, in this situation. We redirect people to their familiar stories to ease the stress or anxiety and get the person to getting back uh, to being, themsel being themselves. Storytelling conversations we know offer emotional safety and connection to the person living with dementia. Okay, I wanna open up the floor for any questions, hear from you, hear your stories. Does storytelling work effectively with persons of all educational levels and in all socioeconomic classes? How do you deal with the challenges of persons who are reserved and quiet? Great answer. Thank you, Monica. We do believe that storytelling if it works effectively with persons of all educational levels and in all socioeconomic classes. We see this um, in different memory support settings. Um, we see this when we have workers who come from all over the world. We really encourage them to tell their stories to our residents and to exchange stories, hear and ask questions. We help them with question posing so that, and they come from a completely different place. And our residents, um, we encourage them to share what they may know about their travels to that particular place, for example. We know that uh, storytelling is a powerful tool. It can convey information, but it can also shift stereotypes. And um, we do believe that personality types, those who are more outgoing, might be more apt to be verbal and share in a group setting. But the person who's quiet and reserved, we really work with them one-to-one -to, -one to ask them what they think about something. We may have, uh, we did a, a poem um, by Ogden Nash and um, it's a favorite poet because he, he invokes humor in his work, but also very practical uh, solutions or stories about what he's encountering. And we do have uh, a few introverted people in our community. We have all types of people. And um, so while others are sharing in the group, there's an opportunity for going to one person personally to say, what did you think about what Ogden was saying about love and uh, what it means today versus what it meant long ago? And she said, I was thinking about that. And I was thinking that he's right. And uh, it may fade away over time, but mostly um, it doesn't if it's really true. And, and she would never say that in the group, but uh, individually she would. And as you build an intentional community with storytelling, people start to gravitate toward those they enjoy. Some are talkers, some are listeners, um, and, 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 and it works because storying is one thing that's universal for all of us. Thank you for sharing the use of story as a healing modality. We instigated a program at the Veterans Hospital 
ah, tell me your story with much success. That's wonderful, Patricia. Patricia is an amazing artist and community healer, if I might say that. So I'm very pleased to know the Veterans Hospital is using storying as a healing modality. This is wonderful. And we have uh, another comment by Patricia. They've been giving away Making Memories Together games. Oh, wow, this is great. Uh, which is a great resource, providing an opportunity for families to share stories vis-a-vis uh, -vis photographs. Again, that visual anchor. Uh, we would like a game, Patricia, maybe two. And um, we, we know how important it is to have those artifacts, um, those uh, the pictures, of course, very important music. Another way to, you have to know your person and know the genre, but you can also talk about the composer. Um, we have uh, uh, many people who love uh, George Gershwin, of course, and Rhapsody in Blue, and then they can hear the first few notes, but it's always great to be reminded of the great brilliance that George uh, possessed and his brother and some of the work they did to try to put it in context and what was going on in the world at that time, that helps to make the story. Then they begin to talk about uh, what they remember about Rhapsody in Blue. Any other questions? We have one at King Farm. Hang on one moment, Marianne. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Can you hear us with the I can. I can hear you. Yes, uh, I understand person. I am uh, blind. Uh, although I have recently had surgery uh, to have a cornea transplant, and I will know uh, more of today as to what my status is. But as regards to your topic today, how would you treat? if I can use that expression, uh, in terms of remembrance and things of that nature for somebody that has visual issues. Uh, if I'm understanding, I just want to repeat, how, how, how can storytelling work for someone with low vision? Well, somebody with no vision, or, 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 or low vision, yeah, that's okay. Low or no vision, excellent. My first opportunity um, in working as an anthropologist was at the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind. And um, one of the experiences that I had uh, was working, um, Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind is located, uh, at that time was located in an area of the city that was in transition. And the, the, the uh, people in the group, all uh, legally blind, um, wanted to feel less fearful about their public safety in waiting for the bus uh, in that community. And so we invited the adolescents to come in and tell their stories and hear the stories of the people who uh, were without vision. Uh, it was a very powerful uh, program. What it showed us though is that we have, we make so many assumptions about one another. And uh, people with low vision have an amazing uh, life behind them usually uh, with great experiences. Um, they can talk about uh, a variety of topics uh, on anything, right? In terms of their learning exposure. And uh, the richness of their stories are so important to be told to others. Uh, and so I would say that much like um, listening to podcasts, which I, I, I really highly recommend for people with low vision to have someone help you to hook into, there are millions today of podcasts on a variety of topics. And what's so great about the podcast is that they're telling stories and they go deep into texture and detail. Um, and that allows for the person who has no vision to be able to call on the resources of their memory in the past, but it also helps them to stay connected to the things that they really enjoy that lift their spirit and 
can really help them to connect with others. I think they're great um, folks. I do encourage people with low vision to come into memory support communities um, where their lives can allow them to continue uh, in terms of their voice. Their voice is critical. And many times, even though they've lost their sight, they still have so much to say. And that's the whole point of the storytelling, the ability to be able to have individualized expression. So I hope that there's a group for you. And if not, then the podcast, I hope that you would, are you familiar with podcasts? Are you familiar with podcasts? Yeah, I'm familiar with specifics. He's aware of them, Mariana, but not, not the specifics. So, so that's, we a, get some resources to him. that's a lot of fun. And we're looking at developing a program for after dinner here at Ingleside. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, mix the program up with movies and podcasts and uh, classic radio um, because we, we really do enjoy the radio. And um, we want to be able to do more with that. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about the radio program in the future. But um, I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you. No more great people say the part at the moment. I missed that, but I hope hopefully. No more great We have another question in the chat okay oh okay uh, i don't see it here oh wait a minute okay does ingleside communicate with the family about how an individual resident participates in the programs yes definitely we do try to offer um each of our families uh, understanding of how their resident is, is fulfilling their day, how they're enjoying it, uh, the program, some of the things uh, which the person says. Um, and there are ways, we'll have to think of ways family members can build on the storytelling activities. One of the things I've noticed is that family members are coming in to be with their loved one during the What's On Your Mind program. Um, this is an after lunch program. It, it wouldn't be available to everyone, but that's a good idea. And I appreciate that idea. We can invite family members to come uh, during that time to help build on the stories, to help flush it out. The important thing I, I do always, uh, I have had, had a couple of family members who come after the program is over to tell me that their loved one didn't tell the story exactly right. And I appreciate that because we, we like facts, right? We're, we're a culture, uh, in, in our culture, we appreciate the facts and getting things right. But the important thing is that, first of all, with storying, and this is more on the topic of storying, we all remember things differently. And um, the most important thing is that the person feels empowered to uh, give their voice and their ideas. And when we think about how difficult it is when you don't have all of your resources and all of our residents know that things are not what's they what they once were we have we we talk about that in part in the uh program that we do on what's on your mind we just did a once a month we talk about uh what's going on emotionally with you and where are you because people when they uh come into assisted living they're leaving in, in a way part of their life behind, a big part of their life. And there's, uh, there's loss and there's grief and there's uh, disorientation around it. And, and we talk about way making, may, helping them make their way and getting to know their new community. And we make a real effort at intentionally building that community uh, and helping them to connect with others um, during the day, uh, during storytelling conversation programs, during the dining experience. So they begin to feel that there's good times ahead. They have connections. 
Um, and they're going to be able to remain who they are, but they're going to now uh, accept and bring in new people into their lives. And storying is one of the ways in which therapeutically we're able to help them make those transitions. We see this especially with couples. Um, we have seven couples uh, where one person lives here, the other person lives elsewhere. Uh, the other person may live uh, in independent living here, they may live out in the community, but we really, we really focus on keeping those families connected. And uh, we, we know that there are programs help, help them in that effort, but storytelling when they're with their loved ones, remembering the good times and the, the travels. Um, we had a program on Banff National Park uh, back in the fall. We have programs on armchair travels several times a week. But in that program, a wife came to be with her husband. And a part of the, uh, the program we were showing um, we use uh, documentary work or snippets of smaller programs that we may have on YouTube, different modalities, NPR. Um, but we showed a, a shot of the um, a, a touring group that was traveling across the ice glacier. And um, we made a point of showing that because the tourists had to wear certain shoes with uh, with the proper uh, amenity with the uh, the spikes that go into the ice, and she and her husband had gone to Banff. I, I didn't know that at the time, and uh, he was so excited about the shoes, and he he was very animated. We have those shoes, and where are those shoes? And then she said, "Oh, I still have them." And she said, "He," she said, "He said you need to bring them because it, it's it, it's going to be snowing." And we'll need them. And um, it was winter time. It was fall actually, but but it was close to December. And we talked about um, those shoes for him meant so much. And the the wife told the entire story of the trip, and uh, I became a a very good storytelling, an example of what storytelling can do, um, in term in terms of a program and memory support. But we, uh, I do like the idea of, of, of demonstrating or reaching out to families to make sure they're here to help build on the activities. It's very nice. Thank you. Anyone else? None of the people take a game farm. Okay. <laughs>